Okay, I'm Connie. I'm actually starting way back in the early 90s. We started a program called PARCUP, Program for Arctic Regional Climate Assessment. That was first funded through NASA and then NSF also came in. It was a joint collaboration. We had several of you participated, I remember that. And that's where we started to put climate network stations out and also collected shallow ice cores. So the emphasis was, what is Greenland doing in the current climate? What is the variability of the accumulation? What is the variability of the climate? So that's the basis of what we call the climate network. I hear say 1990 to present, it's still going on. It still has about 16 stations running. They are monitoring and transmitting every few seconds. So I move on my second slide that shows you the distribution of the GCNet. I have color coded it, but the color code is gone. That means these are the different years we put the stations up. The dark red ones are the ones that came after Swisscam. Swisscam was the first station in 1990. Then Crawford, NASA, UGIT, Humboldt. They're old names that are local but have to do with ice core as well. And you can see several of the locations are current ice cores or current ice core uh, expedition sites. Why ice core? We also need surface climate data when you actually collect an ice core, say this for logistics or say this to understand the precipitation and the network. What you see on the right side on the graph, this is the different stations, Swiss camp in different situations, 1990, 97, 2007. 1990 was actually a cold year. It started pretty cold. I showed that in the temperature record. And we actually even lost the station in 1993 because Mount Pinatuba explosion called the cooling of about 1.8 degree in the Arctic. And we had way more precipitation in snow than ablation. Swiss camp is built at the ELA, Ekrum Line Altitude, the place where accumulation melts away during the summer. Station supposed to be always at the same elevation. You see that's no longer the case. You see the funding agencies, NASA, NSF, also lately, Swiss government, because I moved back about seven years ago, but most of the funding came from the first two, NASA and NSF. Switzerland just chipped in the last, actually, year, basically. My salary was usually paid, which is the major part that my students are working on that project. What does it entail? It's a very simple automatic weather station. It was developed in 1990 is still going very strong. It's a vertical mast of about eight meter that has two levels. We measure all the parameters at two levels, wind temperature, humidity, wind direction, pressure, and radiation net. Radiation means net and short wave in and reflected. In addition, we also measure the snow height so we can actually see what is the accumulation on that location. We have snow temperatures about 10 meters down. All data are locked every 15 seconds and they are averaged over one hour and set by satellite transmission via the antenna on the top. If it's north of 75 degrees, that's an Argos satellite or via a geostationary satellite, so it's a directional antenna below 75 north. Every hour data is sent to satellite and you will see, you can see on the hour, the data directly on our website. We currently have 16 stations. I say currently, we had once 18. We have reduced the network because some of the automatic station data were highly co correlated. So we could reduce some of the locations. It's quite expensive to maintain such a network when I say quite expensive, it's about 150,000 US dollars to chart the logistics every season if you want to maintain all these stations. That's no salary, it's no hardware, it's basically a rental of a twin-otter airplane. The data is available, as you can see, 
on the net on the web i have about 2500 users right now since 2010 i have counted that's only then most users request about 500 megabyte that means mainly the data set that started in 95 with all the stations currently we have a new website it will be ported to NSIDC as well. I will travel there in August. We set up the link. Right now it is at VSL, that's my institution in Switzerland. If you type in that www.vslch slash gcnet, you get a map that's on the right side and all the hot links to these different stations are given. You click on it, you get either the entire annual data for different parameters or the last 10 days. You can change resolution. Most stations are running, you see in color, I do have South Dome, NASA, Southeast, and currently Gits not transmitting because I just uploaded that. And the data is from the Swiss camp. It is from June, and you can see how extremely warm it is this year. This is June 14 to 20 of them. Temperature never dropped below zero except June 17. We actually had, we were at Swiss camp at the beginning of May and we had melting temperatures in the same temperature range. So we had melting already beginning of May, which is extraordinary. We never had in the last 30 years. And we actually had to be evacuated by helicopters because crevasse is opened up underneath our tents. It was extreme warming. You just interrupt me if you have questions. I have no problem with interruption. I otherwise, wait to the end. I show here the record from 1990 to present for the mean annual temperature for Swiss Camp. So at that location, 1100 meters above sea level, which has moved 2.5 kilometers over the time period towards the coast at 30 centimeters per day. In the summer, it goes to 60 or 90, but this is corrected for the elevation. We have very little elevation change in 2.5 kilometers. So basically 0.8 degree per decade warming since we started the measurement. You can see very well the very cool cold period, early 1990, Mount Pinatubo. If I take this data out from the very beginning, we still have a very similar increase in temperature variability is understood. This is the NOA, the fluctuations or the Arctic oscillation. And we have a very strong increase about 2.2 degrees over a cold icy surface. This is not over rock, this is over ice. We can look at other data like the mean surface temperature now given for the month on the left side the vertical axis are the months, two to 12, and then the year. And you can basically see we get the melt period, the middle of the summer, temperatures above zero. And now 2012 is still the record where we had plus two degrees on a monthly average. But when we just look at the temperature, this is, temperature is only the response. What is actually more important is why do we have this? And here you see the albedo, same area, Swiss camp, 1993 to present. We started the radiation 1993. And you can see the bull eyes, 2007, 2010. The albedo was way below the snow. This is actually standing water on ice or bare ice. And that's where you can see once you reach an albedo of 0.5, 50% of your energy is absorbed and used for warming. That means mainly for melting ice. And I will get back to the mass balance at that one location, which is quite interesting. Net radiation is basically the signal. The long wave radiation has no trend. I looked many times at the long wave, so cloudiness is not affecting our energy balance at Swiss camp. And you again see a very strong positive net radiation during the summer. In winter, obviously, we have negative. We lose energy by the long wave radiation. And the summer has up to 50 watts per square meter. I even put in my abstract 60 watts. 
us because if you analyze the data, we have plus 60 watts at the ELA in 2009, 10, and 11. Let's look at the mass balance, which is an indirect understanding of where the energy is going. This is a cumulative curve from 1990 to present, what the surface is doing. Surface means we, if we are around zero, means whatever snow that, that falls during the spring and winter time melts away in the summer. This was true up to about 2002. You can see we are basically in balance. We have a little bit of variability, maybe half a meter of snow or ice. The snow is actually given in the red curve. And after 2002, you can see how it's going down. And we lost that Swiss camp over that period 2002 to basically 2014, about 11 or 12 meters of ice. Now you can visualize that easily with our station. You can see in 2010, the major part of the front of our station collapsed because the station is built on very deep iron rods into the ice. What actually collapsed was pretty sad. That was our soda. No more green scientists anymore after that happening. But we were able to build it up, same station again, new drilling, but we didn't know that we are on that slippery slope and you can see how many meters were lost of ice at what was formerly the LA. And within two years, the entire station collapsed. So there was no meaning of putting it on the same platform. We rebuilt the station the same year. This is a new snow surface. It's a big wooden platform and we have snow, uh, we have wooden pillars going into the ice, I think 24, they're all about 12 meters deep. And we were quite sure now we are safe, we can actually continue our research. We came back next season. This is two and a half, two meters ice loss in one season. And you can even see we have a swimming pool, unfortunately only zero degrees, but there is quite a change. Interesting to note before I show you the next one, if you look at the right side, 2016, 17, 18, we are actually tempering out. We didn't lose the amount of ice we lost before. So right now we actually, for the first time, 2018, we had a very small increase. That means the snow that was falling the year before did not melt all away. The reason for it is we had usually around I think one meter of snow is the average. 2018, we had two meters of precipitation. That snow did not melt all the way, and that's why we have a surplus in the balance. You can see here, that was basically at the end. It's also the location where El Gore came up to visit, and we finished the inconvenient sequence, his movie at Swiss Camp, with all the inside about the melt. Let's move to other places because I also heard that during the introduction, some of you are interested in radiation and that's quite convenient because we run the baseline surface radiation network at summit since 2000. First, it was the ETH group. That's the ETH where I'm currently with, Swiss Federal Institute of Technology. I was then still in Boulder, but I took over their instruments. This year, that was this spring, we placed a new uh, so the tracker that's on the left, this is on the new building where we have the atmospheric measurements and that's easier to maintain. So we have an incoming short wave, an incoming long wave. They are heated and ventilated and even shaded. So we actually have correction for it. And we have, as you can see, through heliometers, these tubes on the side, they measure the sun directly in different wavelengths. On the right side is again an incoming but mainly reflected. So this is a very accurate measurement. We record the data in minutes intervals. The data is all available. It's made available through the NOAA collaboration with Boulder. They download the data, they even clean it, and the data can be requested directly through the NOAA group or through me, but I usually refer them to the NOAA group. One interesting outcome come from this 
is also we have so much measurement in radiation that we can parameterize now indirectly long wave radiation by air temperature. We have long term air temperature measurements. We have 10 to 15 year long wave radiation measurement. That is, for example, a long wave parameterization by using air temperature. You can actually see how the correlation fits 0.993. And on the right side, this is now plotted for 2002, but I can do it for, for any other year for a period of 50 days where I measured long wave outgoing radiation and I calculated based on that parameterization and it works very well. Of course, there is a small error, but the error is actually small. You can see it's 0.11 watts per square meter as a difference and the formula is given again. We can summarize what is the annual radiation balance for summit and here we can look at the global radiation in black, the famous curve, it's centered around the month. We have now January through December. We have the net radiation in red, which is here given as positive, should be actually, no net radiation. Yeah, it's positive given here. Long wave sky radiation and the uh, long wave out radiation. I'm puzzled because I always thought net radiation was, net radiation should be actually the green one. I think there's a misspelling. We have net radiation should be positive during the summer months, negative in the winter. So I apologize, green and red is reversed. You can see that here, the monthly summary again, so we can actually see how much effective short wave radiation, how much effective long wave and the net radiation is actually the, uh, the total. We have a surplus of 140 mega joules per square meter in the summer month. We know, because we measured with turbulent instruments as well, eddy correlation, that we have an instability at summit during the summer month, which is strange because usually you have a very cold surface, meteorological or microclimatological, you would not expect to have particles rising, but we do have, and that's shown in that net radiation balance. The summary okay. is given here. It was confirmed with some of the correlation. We published that in the early 2000, 2005. Nicholas Cullen did his PhD on that topic. Connie, can I ask a question? Oh, of course you can. Uh, on the slide, there seems to be 11 months. Which one month is missing? Uh, 11 months, which one? 1 through 12. Is it one? Which graph is it? Sorry. Oh, so it's uh, the value centered on the number. Yes. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, 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 yeah. There are different ways to do it. You're correct. Yeah. No months missing, Andreas. This is an interesting one because you all remember 2012. We had melt to all the way to the summit. And the question was, how can that be? And luckily we had all the radiation incidents running very accurately during that time period. It actually happened to be at the WCRP meeting in Beijing. When I first saw that we get melt that far up, I immediately downloaded some of the net radiation instruments from the BSRN and then together with my the group at NOAA, that paper was published in Nature, which even made it on the front page. The reason for the melt at summit at the very top was the semi-transparent liquid water cloud. If we would have a complete cloud cover, we would not have had the, the warming underneath. If there would be clear sky, we could not, and you can see all the calculation given in this very small graph that's given in the paper. I cannot go into that detail, but we proved by the instruments from the measurements and then the modeling, you needed a semi-transparent cloud and the cloud was actually water, liquid water cloud. What is interesting is that these clouds get more and more common in a warming climate. Some remote sensing uh, people have verified that. I have not seen any more data recently, 
but I would be very interested because as you probably have heard the last month, we had again a huge melt event that didn't go all the way to the summit, but started to cover a major part of Greenland. How much was a semi-transparent liquid cloud involved or not? I don't know yet. It will be interesting to look at. I think I went through my 15 minutes. Unfortunately, I was not given one and a half hours what I usually like to talk. This is the summit station. Please give me feedback about data. I'm very good in good collaboration with Andreas, his group. And we have the data transmitted to the Danish Met Office. I still hope you receive some of them. We had some problems with the transmission lately. The data has now revamped. It is all on website available. And if you don't receive the data you need, please send me an email. I have a postdoc now working more on that. He came from Boulder, Derek Houts, and he's very capable of reprogramming and doing that. Thank you for your attention and hope you have some questions. <laughs> Who is on mute? I can't hear you. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much, Connie. Uh, that was excellent. Uh, I'll, as Connie says, I'll open up the floor for questions uh, briefly, and then uh, maybe we can, uh, any quick ones specific to Connie, and then we can have Ruth and have a, a larger discussion afterwards. So, so Joe, I've got a question. Um, Connie, thanks for the nice presentation. I, I was interested to see that the 2012 event, the albedo at the surface actually seemed to be quite high for that year. And I wonder, um, given that there was this warming and melt event, what other factors were in play to keep the albedo from dropping that year? Was that at Swiss camp or at summit? Uh, well, I guess it was at Swiss camp that, that you were okay. trying. Okay, Swiss camp of course is, it all depends what kind of a snow you have. and. Swiss Camp 2012, I just looked it up on my phone because I have my presentation here as well. And it is true, it was in the order of point, uh, 07 or even higher. That means we actually had probably a snowfall in between. And if you have only a trace of snow, as you know, it takes maybe a few days for the snow to actually start melting because it's such a strong reflection that was the main problem when Walid Abdaladi he did, did his PhD at Swiss camp and he wanted to measure the snow wetness. And unfortunately the year he started his measurements, it only snowed. And every week we were hoping the snow gets old enough to absorb, there was a new snowfall. So one short, short snowfall can actually cut off the melt. And I assume I have to go back in the original data set, but it's correct to say, 2012 was not a major, major melt year at Swiss Camp. It was a melt for the entire ice sheet, correct? Thanks. Um, one quick follow-up question, if that works. There are no other questions. Um, so one of my main interests is the spatial variability of some of these quantities. And I wonder to what extent there have been efforts to map this at some of the sites that you've been making measurements at in terms of you know, how representative the single albedo measurement would be at Swiss Camp or at Summit or other places um, relative to, let's say, a square kilometer or so around the camp. Actually, we did that. I had in the early days, 1990 to 95, I make about, made several multi-kilometer long profiles with radiometers where I put them on gimbals. So they were actually looking straight down to look at the spatial variability that was not that great. What was bigger was actually the problem is the surface roughness. And the roughness had a very strong effect on the albedo since you have to somehow shading. It's not different snow melt types because it, since it is so homogeneously flat, elevation over 20 kilometers is about 15 meters. So you have, don't have really a gradient but the variability on the surface is quite large. And you can see that during the time when you are in spring, when we have the blowing snow, as soon as we have blowing snow, you change the surface and the albedo changes immediately. And some areas have no snow depositions, other have. We just started a snow drifting project this year. 
but as it is, there was no snow drift. It was too warm. We wanted to find out what causes the saltation of the snow over short distance and how long does it take to evaporate the snow crystals. So some of it has to do with the physical turnover of the snow into water vapor redeposition, re but mainly the surface roughness is one of the major parameters, yes. Great, thank you. Great, thanks. Any other quick questions for Connie? If not, uh, let's move on to, to Ruth Matra, and uh, then we can have a combined discussion afterward. Uh, Ruth, uh, would you like to go, go ahead? Okay, let me just share my screen. Let's see. You can see at the end. Can you see my screen okay? Not yet? Not yet. Oh, hang on, I need to press it up. There we go. <laughs> All right. Yeah, okay. no one's Good. Um, so let me press that one. Good. So um, I'm going to uh, talk quite a lot about models. So thank you very much, Connie, for a really nice introduction because I'm also going to talk a little bit about the data that you've been collecting for such a long time now. Um, and I'm going to show a lot of stuff from other colleagues who are also working with Harmony. Um, I want to set a little bit of context, first of all. Um, so uh, DMI is the National Weather Service for Denmark, Greenland, and the Faroes. And we also provide a lot of data for shipping. Uh, we do the ice chart mapping around Greenland. We produce, provide uh, operational weather forecasts for airplanes. And now we also do a lot of climate services and we're in the process of preparing a new climate atlas that will also build on Harmony. So that's just for those who maybe haven't really heard of us before. Um, and then uh, just to set it a little bit in context, we've, we run quite a, a large sort of range of different models at uh, DMI. I'm not going to talk about all of these, but we go from the full global scale. We're one of the members of the EC Earth Consortium. We run permafrost models, ice sheet models. We're very focused on Arctic climate. I uh, have mostly been running HEARHAM, and now I'm running, moving over to HGLIM, which I will talk about a little while. We also run Harmony Arome, which is our numerical weather prediction model, and uh, we use the output from that to force a surface mass balance model, which uh, you may or may not be aware of is on the polar portal. Um, and so I thought I'd start with what is Harmony and Harmony Arome, because I guess that most people have not heard of it or aren't really sure what it is. So I, I hope you can see me okay, it's getting dark here. <laughs> um, so uh, building a model is quite expensive, especially an NWP model. And I wanted to show this because uh, it's very important, I think, to recognize that a model like Harmony is a major collaboration. And so this is showing all the different uh, sort of NWP consortia in Europe. Uh, you can see that the yellow ones are the sort of basically using the German Cosmo model. This is, I guess, what Switzerland is using as well, Connie. Uh, we have the green countries, which is the Hirlam collaboration, and um, the UK is off doing its own thing. <laughs> and uh, everybody else is either Hirlam or Aladdin. And Hirlam and Aladdin are quite related models, so based on the French uh, model system. And those two consortia have recently come together in the Hirlam Aladdin consortium to develop Harmony further. And I will say that Harmony, it's if you want to ask what is Harmony, so it stands for Hilam Maladan Research on Mesoscale Operational NWP in Euromed, and that's because it's not just, of course, Northern Europe, it's also Mediterranean countries and North African countries. But the point about Harmony is it's really a system. It includes a lot of different models, different parameterization schemes. So it has a lot in common with, for example, WARF in the US, which I guess more people on this call would be familiar with. I'm going to mostly focus on Arome and Surfex in this talk because those are the two bits that I use the most. We can, in principle, use these other models. Hirlam is basically the name of the old model which we used to run. That's no longer being run. We now only use Harmony. Um, but Hirham, the regional climate model, is partly based on Hirlam, and I'll come back to that as well. Um, Surfex and Arome, which are the sort of two core models I'm going to talk about, they're both from Meteo France and uh, developed there and now also being developed in the other Hirlam Aladin um, countries. 
Uh, so at DMI, we run um, Harmony Around for these two main domains. Uh, COMEPS is a large 25 member ensemble that is run constantly to provide uh, particular severe weather warnings, especially at this time of year, we often have cloud bursts. And so COMEPS was developed at DMI to provide uh, early warning of these kind of things. And then IGB is the, uh, the one that I'll talk about most. And so IGB is a shared domain with the Icelandic Met Office. Our supercomputer actually sits in Iceland. And we run this domain together and then our weather forecasters use the output from the IGB model to produce the, the forecast. And it's the IGB model that we use, uh, the output from the IGB model, I should say, that we use to provide uh, surface mass balance on the pole portal. We don't just run uh, IGB for the whole of Greenland. This is uh, some operational domains. Um, we have the, the blue ones here on the left. Uh, the, the, these are uh, this. Uh, is showing a wind event, a Peterak event in Pasilak. And so we run an operational uh, 750 meter resolution model over these uh, subdomains within the IGB domain. The blue ones are run operationally as standard, the green ones are run when the weather forecasters think that there's a risk of a Peterak happening. So they are sort of run on demand as opposed to being run all the time. And the, the value of running at 750 meters is really shown by these plots because you can see that we actually start to really properly resolve the topography around to Silak. When we went down to two and a half kilometers from five kilometers uh, for the weather forecasting model, we found that we were getting better Peter Axe in Tessilak, but we were also getting a lot of false positives. And so the decision was made to go down to this uh, very high resolution. And uh, you can see that here, um, this is, uh, again, you can see that the blue circle is around to see like you can see the difference both in the orography that is being resolved by these very high resolution domains uh, and then the wind patterns are, are very, very different. So that's, uh, that's kind of an interesting thing that is giving really nice results now. And this is just to show uh, some observations in blue and then the green is the very high resolution uh, run, uh, the red is the standard IGB and this is just to show that actually the to see like during this uh, event, we were getting much better results uh, compared to observations than we were with the, uh, the old or the standard IGB model. So as I have alluded to, we, we output the data from the IGB model domain. And we run it through a surface mass balance model and we produce a daily updated surface mass balance. This is uh, yesterday. Um, and uh, you can see that uh, actually we've been negative, negative, negative all the way down. Um, but today it's gone positive and that's not because melting has decreased. As you can see, our melt extent is still pretty broad, but we've had some snowfall events which have been counterbalancing that. And so one of the challenges I often face is <laughs> explaining the difference between melting and surface mass balance. Our surface mass balance is run offline. It's uh, got 60 layers. It goes down to 100 meters. It includes all the refreezing and melt water retention parameterization. So obviously, uh, you know, you're evaluating how well these kind of models are doing is quite challenging. And we are in the process of uh, running a, a RETMIP, which is a, a model into comparison, looking at retention parameterizations. And this is the accumulated anomaly. So our season runs from the 1st of September to 31st of August. And you can see here that uh, the season up to now has been a pretty dry winter, relatively low snowfall, um, except for the southeast of Greenland, where there has been quite a lot of snow, actually more snow than, than normal. Um, and then the early melt, which we have also seen in the model. I was very happy to hear that our model is not completely off funny. Um, has actually also had an, an impact on this sort of accumulated anomaly over the, uh, the ice sheet. Um, so our regional climate and surface mass balance model is based on the Hilam, the Hiham model, which was originally derived in the dynamics from Hilam 8 and then the FM5 global model. And this has been our workhorse for many years. Uh, it's, we run it as a standard at five kilometer horizontal resolution. It has a full surface energy balance model. It has all these kind of processes that go on in the snowpack. And we can also assimilate modus albedos. And this has given us a much better performance, especially when the bare ice is exposed because uh, parameterizing the bare ice albedo has been really actually a very challenging problem. Um, and we're still not quite there. And all the output is available to download if uh, anybody's looking for it. 
So um, on the polar portal, and I forgot to say this, um, these grey bands here in the graphs at the bottom, um, these are actually based on Hirham, and then we're and we're using that as our climatology, and then the the blue lines and the red lines are based on harmony. Um, we wanted to know a little bit about you know are these two models comparable because it is a bit difficult where you're taking out one model and then you're comparing it with another model which is similar but not quite the same and so I had a student look at uh, the difference between Hirham and Harmony uh, for 2017 which happened to be a year we had an overlapping period for and uh, you can see here at the top we've got the Harmony surface mass balance and then below it's Hirham minus Harmony and uh, effectively what this shows is that the, the precipitation is pretty similar but there are some differences and this is related to the higher resolution of Harmony and it also has a prognostic precipitation scheme so the um, the semi-Lagrangian models or the, the, the hydrostatic models like Hirham, like RECMO, they typically uh, give too much precipitation on the upslope and then it's a little bit too dry on the downslope. And we see that in places like Renland uh, and the very rugged topography in southeast Greenland. This problem we get over a little bit with here, with Harmony because it has this prognostic precipitation scheme and these very advanced microphysics in the clouds, which um, typically help. Uh, we have a little bit more to go through. Uh, so uh, Hirham also has um, a little bit more melting than Harmony, and that's because we had to do a fix to the surface scheme of the Harmony. Uh, the Harmony model uses the surface physics, but it doesn't have glacier ice implemented in it yet. That's coming. <laughs> I'm going to speed up a little bit because I can see that time is moving on. And so uh, just to show that basically we see that when we look at the components um, for this period, over the whole ice sheet. Hirham is getting a little bit more um, in the way of snow melt because the albedo scheme has been more tuned and it's able to better characterize what's going on at the surface. Uh, Harmony in this run, and this is an older version of Harmony, is not uh, properly characterizing bear ice. We've improved it since then. And so we will repeat this uh, comparison soon. Um, and just to show that uh, so the surface mass balance data is comparable, but it's not exactly the same. And I think that that's something we have to be aware of when we're looking at the polar portal data. Um, but the incoming radiation we're extremely happy with. This is uh, some of the uh, promise stations. And you can see the incoming shortwave radiation for Harmony is actually extremely good. The outgoing, we have this problem that the albedo, sur surface albedo is not properly captured in this version of Harmony. And so to get around this, what we've done is basically piled up enormous amounts of snow so that it's always melting snow. And so we're getting the energy budget almost right, but we're never getting bare ice exposed in this version of Harmony. And I will come back to that. So as I mentioned, similar to WARF, we can use Harmony in different ways. Uh, that was all the sort of NWP kind of stuff that we're doing. Um, Harmony Climate is the next uh, step, HFLIM as it is known. Um, there's a couple of papers that are currently in review, including this uh, one I put down at the bottom. And the point about HFLIM is we can run it at very different resolutions um, from sort of 30 to 50 kilometers, through the gray zone of five kilometers, uh, or down to convection permitting simulations with a roam. Um, there have been some initial results for Greenland. Nobody has run HCLIM Arome for Greenland yet. I'm currently applying for computer time at the European Centre to do those simulations next year. But it is operational over Scandinavia. We've done um, three uh, time slices through the 21st century um, with different um, GCM forcing and different climate scenarios. And these are three kilometer convection permitting simulations uh, that are pretty heavy, but they actually give us fantastic results. We're really happy with its performance over Scandinavia. And you can see here, Connie, that I'm, uh, I'm, I think these ones are just using Promise, but uh, I'm coming to your stations shortly, which is here. So uh, one of the things we're working on at DMI with our partners across the Nordic region, uh, also Geus and uh, Meteo France, um, is that we are really running a new reanalysis for the Arctic or the European Arctic. Um, and this is um, a project that uh, Copernicus kind of asked for bids for, and we put together a consortium to do it. And we're using the same IGB domain. We've actually split the European Arctic into two domains. We have our own Arctic domain, which is sort of northern Scandinavia, and then we have uh, Greenland and Iceland and parts of Canada. And uh, so this is the same as our IGB domain. 
Um, it's two and a half kilometers and it's going from 1997 to 2021. We have full 3D data assimilation within the domains. Um, and then we will do a panarctic uh, demonstration for the final, for one year, just to, as a sort of proof of concept. They're pretty heavy runs computationally, so it, it's taking some time. Um, yes, uh, what else? And then um, the point about doing it at such high resolution is because we have very rugged topography, especially in the coast of Greenland, we really want to resolve that. And uh, by going down to two and a half kilometers, we really see a big improvement over the era five reanalysis, which is what we're using to course with on the boundaries. Um, and you can see that, uh, especially the, the surface properties, uh, two meter temperature and wind, we have a very big improvement over era five. Um, I can show more of results later, but I guess that everybody's not <laughs> interested in the detail of this. There has been a huge amount of work done in to improve the surface scheme. And so some of this work is what we will import into the NWP Harmony and into that Harmony climate. This is kind of, you know, it's a continuous process of improvement. There have always been a lot of errors in glacier masks used over Iceland and Greenland, and these have been significantly updated as part of this project. The physiographic files have been improved. And I will say that a lot of this stuff is basically available. So if anybody is running a model and they want to use the most up-to-date physiographic fields, they can, and that includes things like soil types and topography, then do get in touch because this is supposed to be available for everybody to use. Um, and uh, one of the nice things that we've done working with uh, Andreas and his colleagues at Gaius is we, um, the Modus albedos that we've been assimilating into here, and we're now assimilating these into the, uh, the reanalysis. And this is actually something that, again, will become available for other modeling groups to use in their models if they want to assimilate Modus data. And uh, we've also worked quite closely with Meteor France for this. And so here you can see uh, basically, one particular day, this is uh, Jason Box and Ken Mankoff from, from Gaius have produced these uh, very nice plots showing the, uh, the evolution of the uh, albedo through the season. And this gives us a really much better performance of the surface energy budget at the surface, which you can see here. Uh, so the green here is the Promise station observations, and then the Alpha 2 was the, the one before the assimilation of albedos and beta 2 is the one afterwards and so we're getting a really significant improvement in surface climate by assimilating these uh, modus albedos. We're now using uh, all these stations and uh, assimilating this data into the uh, reanalysis um, and that's GCNet, it's also ASIAC who are the Greenland survey, they have 11 stations that we're assimilating as well as the PROMISE and the DMI stations. And I think the plot on the left here is quite interesting because you can see that Iceland is very densely covered with weather stations and Greenland really isn't. So this is one of the challenges of getting good model results for Greenland is we don't have the data to assimilate into it. Um, so this is, uh, I think, my last slide. And this is just to show that we're getting a really significant improvement. Um, this is the two meter temperature error, the, the standard deviation is improved and the bias is also improved when we compare with observations. And uh, I'm gonna stop there. So that was a very quick tour of Harmony. <laughs> Great, thank you so much, Ruth, that was excellent. Uh, yeah, uh, I've got several questions, but first uh, I'd like to uh, open it up to the, to the audience uh, for questions. Anyone have a pressing one that they'd like to uh, pose for Ruth? This is Faisal. I'm wondering whether any of these activities are specifically geared towards um, activities related to the year of polar prediction. I don't, I'm sorry if I missed that along the way, but I don't know if there are any um, evaluation activities connected to the year of polar prediction specifically. That's a good question. I don't know, actually. Um, I. I know that some DMI projects are connected to the year of polar prediction. I'm not sure if any of these specifically are. Um, the the CARA reanalysis really came out of the European Commission and Copernicus saying that they wanted to have an Arctic reanalysis. And when we first put the um, the um, the, the consortium together and said, this is what we could do. They said, oh, we really wanted to have it uh, pan-Arctic, not 
in these domains. But then we pointed out we would be using most of the European Centre's computer resources for the next five years if we tried to do Pan-Arctic at that resolution. And so this is how we've done it. But I, I'm not sure, actually. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ruth, you, mentioned, you mentioned the reanalysis for the European Arctic. At what resolution are you doing the reanalysis? It's at two and a half kilometers. Okay. And yeah. there is a question from the Zoom group. Is how ah. many hydro, hydrostatic model was the question? No, it's non-hydrostatic. Okay. Um, and that's why we can go down to very high resolutions. Ruth, I have a, I have a question, uh, a couple of questions about the sort of topography related. When you were comparing uh, the improvement of harmony versus Hiram, you, uh, you were mentioning that having better topography helped, especially in the southeast of Greenland, which makes a lot of sense. But then uh, the differences, uh, some of the differences seem to be largest in the northeast, like in the Zachariah 79 North region. I, yeah. I, you know, there is topography there, but I didn't, I, What's the physical rationale for those differences? There? Yeah, so I think that this is uh, related to the surface scheme um, in Harmony. So that particular version of Harmony doesn't have uh, bare ice albedos. Uh, so what we do, so when we first, I, I, I did put it in, but I took it out because I had too many slides anyway. Uh, when we first started running Harmony over the ice sheet, it was just for the weather forecast and they weren't at all interested in the ice sheet. And so we were getting really weird features like convection cells over the ice sheet and, and winds going completely wrong. And it turned out that um, once the snow had melted off, the model saw tarmac. Just, I don't really know why, but that was the default surface setting. And so to get over that, we had to introduce various fixes. We allowed the, say, the surface to melt properly and to keep melting. And then we also effectively changed the surface scheme. So we pile tons of snow on at the start of every season. Okay. And then it just melts the snow. So it never actually sees bare glacier ice. Whereas Hereham has a bare glacier ice albedo scheme in it. And so the big difference in the northern part of Greenland is basically the albedo schemes. And that's why this is something that we really need to develop properly in surfex that we apply into the Harmony system rather than just running with what we have. And that's what I'll be working on for the rest of this year, basically. Okay, cool. And if I can follow up on that, thank you for that answer. That helps a lot. Um, trying to connect back to one of the things that Connie mentioned towards the end that, uh, and, and I'm paraphrasing here, that uh, in terms of understanding surface melting effects, the, the roughness, uh, the small scale roughness of the surface seemed to be, uh, you know, of comparable importance to the albedo at times. And, yes, uh, you know, I you, absolutely agree. <laughs> yeah, and you, meant, you mentioned towards the end, you're, you're, you're forever improving the topography that you use uh, to represent uh, uh, the, the ice surface. And, uh, you know, although you, 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 it's probably gonna be a while before we're, you know, anyone's, using effectively on a regular basis Arctic DM at two meters, which might actually capture that small scale roughness. Is there any hope to try to bridge that, that gap somehow, maybe with a parameterization of surface roughness, leveraging self affinity or something like that? Yeah, it's a really, really good question. And it is something that we're also quite worried about. Um, and so how many has a spectral albedo scheme? And so we kind of working with that a little bit um, to, because the surface roughness is really important. It's also important for the sensible heat fluxes, okay. um, especially during melt events. And we can see that that really makes a big difference. And so that's something else that, uh, so a lot of the regional climate models, it's starting to change now, but a lot of them only have a single value for snow and for a single value for ice. And it's completely wrong. You can't use a single value for snow and ice. Um, and so there has to be a slightly smarter way to do that. Mm -hmm. um, so those are that there's things that we're starting to try and parameterize in a meaningful way. But I would say it's still quite a lot of work in progress. But that's why it's nice that we have so many uh, observations from places like Summit Station and from the Promise Network and, and having these kind of gradients along the uh, the ice sheet surface, having the accumulation zone and the ablation zone is really important. Yeah, I totally agree. Yeah. Uh, anyone else questions? Uh, Andreas. Yeah. Uh, Ruth, um, thank you for your nice presentation. I was wondering from the observational network side, um, which observations are you currently lacking from us? What would be most helpful for your work? 
to add <laughs> <our> stations? <laughs> That's a really good question, actually. Yeah, I think, <laughs> uh, to an extent, what's missing is the spatial variability. Um, so Connie mentioned that some of the stations correlate really well with each other. And so you can take them out. And this is something that DMI has been doing. We've been taking stations out because it's too expensive to maintain them all. Um, but if you look at places like the southeast of Greenland, those are places where there's enormous spatial variability. We have almost no observations. <laughs> so that's one thing. And the other thing is precipitation. And I know that precipitation is really tough. I think I showed this, uh, maybe, I don't know if I can go back here. Yeah, so in this slide here where you can see um, Iceland is covered in observations. And a lot of those have precipitation measurements. Greenland has seven functioning precipitation gauges. And even then, we know that precipitation gauges don't work very well. So a smarter way to measure that would be fantastic. <laughs> if, if, if I can answer that, um, I can't promise you more stations. Uh, <laughs> that is just too expensive. Uh, but we are actually installing these uh, new instruments uh, called the snow foxes, which yeah, should measure the... Yeah. Yeah, the should measure the uh, change in, in density of whatever is above the instrument over time. So that's a, a huge improvement in terms of measuring um, snowfall and, and the snow water equivalent. They're expensive instruments, so we only have six of them so far, but uh, yeah. that's, that's improving. <laughs> Almost doubling the uh, precipitation observations that way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I can add to that one too. At Summit Station, they have an upward looking radar that measures continuously now for three years. And we do actually know not only the amount of snow, but also the density and structure. We had the same instrument running for the last two years at Swiss Camp inverted, so we looked down. So until we had melt, we have quite a lot of information. And Achim uh, from Germany has one at at uh, die two, so there are three snow radars that they yeah. could be added. I mean, we are publishing papers that are coming now out. We are just putting them through our internal uh, revision. There is some data coming from time series of accumulation at one point. I know you want spatial variability, but I think you have to be happy to have one point quite accurate. No, I agree. And, and actually we're using Achim's data from die two in our retention MIP. Um, and it's really, I think it's really valuable. But one of the nice things about Harmony is that we can run it as a single column version and we can also run it in nested subdomains. And so one of the things I'm applying for computer time with for the European Center is not just to run the whole of Greenland and to do climate simulations with them, but also to do these kind of process studies at places like Summit where the observations are really good. Because uh, one of the things that I really want to look at is uh, cloud microphysics. And we know that, uh, so Harmony also has the microphysics scheme out of IFS, which is the European Centre's model. So you can choose which schemes you switch on and that kind of thing. So it makes it a really powerful tool for trying to get what's going on at the surface energy budget level, as well as in the atmosphere. In addition to that, we actually developed an L-band radar with my group, they are aerospace engineers. We tested that one in Switzerland and this year in Greenland, and it, we actually get the water content and density structure. And we put now a small L-band radar antenna on a big drone that will be flown this year in Switzerland, next year in Greenland. So I hope to give you actually some spatial variability of accumulation directly from the L-band. That's a newer device. We are that sounds very really exciting. I have two postdocs working on it. It's very promising. We're submitting a paper on that one as well. That sounds really promising. Cool. Um, I have a question for Ruth, if, uh, if possible. Um, is, is there any uh, parameterization of uh, snow drift in the new uh, surface scheme in Surfex? Uh, because I guess it will be important when comparing to surface measurements that monitor surface ac accumulation and not sn directly snowfall. That's a good question. Um, I didn't really go into this detail, but um, so because we have surfex in the model, surfex has different ways of dealing with the surface scheme. And so at the moment, what we're doing is just outputting it and running it through our own surface mass balance model. 
but it also includes crocus, for example, the French snowpack model, um, and it has been massively updated. So the H. Glim variant, the climate variant that I'm mostly working with now, is um, it's a sort of hybrid. It doesn't have all of the surfex physics in it yet, but it will do. And I think that there is some snow, wind distribution of snow. There's certainly wind compaction and sublimation in there. I'm not quite sure if it also has redistribution of snow yet, but um, it's something that we could definitely look at putting in. There are probably areas where it's important. And because we want to run Harmony, maybe also at the other pole, uh, then we need to also put it in for that. Okay, thanks. Oh, we've got another question from uh, Tree. Uh, does Harmony, the, the model I presume, uh, include blowing snow, uh, sublimation as well as erosion? Um, so it's sort of what I was saying with um, to, to Baptiste. Uh, it can do if you switch it on, um, I think, for some of it, but I'm not exactly sure how many of the parameters. So in, in principle, yes, but it may not have been tested. And so what we're looking at right now, we, use, we have a sublimation from uh, blowing snow, but we don't redistribute it. So, so with, uh, with two experts on uh, the surface mass balance uh, and, and weather uh, for the Greenland ice sheet, uh, the, their ears, I have to ask you, what is your prediction for 2019, uh, if you dare make one, and what is the basis for that? <laughs> uh, ba you know, it, st it started with a bang so far, it's calmed down a little bit, uh, but what should we be monitoring to, to have a better sense of what's gonna be happening in the next few months in terms of melt? <laughs> I can start from experience and I say it's about 30 years. Uh, this year was the earliest year we had melt. What happened is actually the, the snow, which was about 80 centimeter at ELA, has already reduced to about 40 when we left by the 10th of May. So I think we'll get an early year of getting a bare ice surface, which has a very strong feedback. I would expect a major melt here because we, are we actually got the warming, the snow is already temperate by the 10th and at least at 75 north where we were and large areas I have seen big lakes building up. I would expect a major melt there. I would even go close to 2012, not in elevation, but in the amount of melt. That's my prediction. But Great. of course I have my AWS data I can always check. <laughs> that meeting. Not today, sorry. Today was great. But if I want to see another data set, I go on my station and then I indirectly get the melt. Yeah, I think I think it's quite likely it's going to be a high melt, high mass loss year. Um, but you have to keep your eye on the North Atlantic Oscillation, basically. Okay. So if that shifts suddenly and the rest of the summer is relatively cool and there's lots of fresh snow, then that won't, you know, it's that it's the old quote that prediction is hard, especially about the future. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, the conditioning is there. And actually, so we, um, we have a sort of threshold. We say three days with more than 5% of the ice sheet melting. It's the start of the melt season. This was the second earliest start to the melt season after this really freak event we had in 2016 when we had a really a lot of melt uh, like a few days earlier in April. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah, and it seems like with all the snow the southeast got early on, uh, which Ice Bridge remembers because it was quite hard to get out there, uh, that maybe the southeast might uh, not lose a lot this year? Well, I think you have to be a bit careful about the southeast because it's true that the southeast did get a lot of snow, but lower down on the glaciers. Is that what you're going to say, Andreas? <laughs> okay. Lower down on the glaciers, you can see big red spots. Um, so not all of the precipitation that fell, fell as snow. Okay. So, um, so. Uh, if, I, if I can add something here. <laughs> uh, I was I was actually on the ice sheet in southeast uh, on those red spots in late April on a dog sled, and uh, we had rain in for three consecutive days on the ice sheet at 1,000 meters elevation. So it adds to to Connie's and and Ruth's stories here. I think if 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 the 
if all that snow that is supposedly falling in Southeast, if that is already really wet with all the rain, um, then it's, it's, you know, it's supposed to, 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 to disappear much earlier than, than previously. So given, uh, I guess the NAO is, is important here, but if, depending on how that works, then it's, it's definitely possible that we get a very extreme year, as Connie said. Yeah, I think it definitely is. Well, uh, any last questions for the audience? I know we're, we're from the audience. I know we're... I, I can see that Twyla has a, a question oh. on chat. Oh, she's... Oh, yeah. Uh, for Con Connie, do you see the question? Oh, yeah. Is there a sense of the future longevity of for measurements at Swiss Cap? Okay, mine. That is a hard one because since NSF pulled me out a week early, I actually got a promise from NSF and I know some of NS folks are listening in here. We need a high resolution satellite map of all the crevasses around Swiss Camp because we need to make sure it is safe. We are usually mountaineers and next year I only take mountaineers to the camp. No <laughs> photographers, no journalists, hard rock climbers only. So we can manage all these small crevasses that are only one meter across. The activity of Swiss Cap, no, I think it will fall down. It needs to be rebuilt and it should be rebuilt higher up, about 45 kilometers from the current location. Great. Well, that was a pretty definitive answer. Thank you, Connie. <laughs> uh, great. All right. Well, uh, Mer shall we wrap it up, Meredith? Sounds like a good plan. Yeah, I know it's uh, it's quite late uh, it, for our speakers uh, over in Europe, and uh, we do really appreciate uh, you taking the time and at such an unusual time of day uh, for you uh, to present what you've been up to, and that was fantastic. Uh, uh, any uh, Caitlin or uh, anyone else from the modeling team want to add anything? No, I'll just echo, uh, Joe, what you just said, which is that I really appreciate the opportunity and thanks both to you, uh, Connie and Ruth, for taking the time out of your evening to put together such a nice uh, synthesis of both observations and modeling. And and for everybody on the call, um, I know sometimes on these webinars it can be tricky to uh, pipe in and fit into the flow of the 60 minutes we have together. So, um, you know, Toby, I know you were just on the ice a few weeks ago and um, your wheelhouse is definitely, you know, in this world and, and anybody else, if you have, you know, follow up questions or you want to keep the information flowing. Um, part of the point of IARPA collaborations is to facilitate that communication. So this is just a, a really nice opportunity for us to spend the hour together um, kind of thinking about and um, reflecting on all of this content. And uh, thanks again to our speakers. You're welcome. Thank you for inviting me. Same from here. This was the first meeting I participated in and I now joined two discussion groups and I think I will come in. It's a perfect time for me because it's after dinner usually <laughs> and what else can you do than watching some interesting talks? Yeah, excellent. <laughs> Better <laughs> than Netflix. Thank you. If you're not part of IRPIC already, we encourage you to join Glaciers and Sea Level Collaboration Team. We'll have another meeting in August on uh, the sediment that uh, Glaciers put out should be a good one with Irina Overeem and uh, uh, Doug Brinkerhoff. Is that right, Caitlin? No, oh, Irina from Boulder. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's correct. Yeah, yeah. And uh, modeling team, do you want to give a quick update on uh, what's coming up next for you? Uh, atmosphere collaboration team. Oh, pardon me. <laughs> um, yeah. Yes, our next meeting will be in July, and I believe it is on um, satellite based perspectives of high latitude um, atmospheric processes and Tristan Le Coyer will be presenting there from Wisconsin. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you again, everyone, and to our speakers. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining, and uh, have a good rest of your week. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Cheers. Bye-bye.